Hello, fellow foodies. This is Dr. Cassandra Quave, and you're listening to Foodie Pharmacology, the science podcast for the food curious. Today on the show, we're going to revisit with one of my favorite food topics, and this is the place where microbes and innovation meet. There's so much that fermentation brings to our table, and I'm so excited to speak with one of my favorite fermenting gurus, probably the guru of fermentation, Sandor Katz, about his latest book, Fermentation Journeys. So let me remind you a bit about Sandor and his expertise. So Sandor is a fermentation revivalist and the author of five books, um, including Wild Fermentation, The Art of Fermentation, The Revolution Will Not Be Microwaved, Fermentation as Metaphor, and his latest Fermentation Journeys. Sandor's books, along with the hundreds of fermentation workshops he has taught around the world, have helped to really catalyze a broad revival of the fermentation arts. A self-taught experimentalist who lives in rural Tennessee, the New York Times calls him one of the unlikely rock stars of the American food scene. Sandor is the recipient of a James Beard Award and many, many other honors. So thanks so much for coming on the show, Sandor. It was so much fun speaking to you. Um, I think we went back to season two of the show. And when I saw your new book come out, I just had to invite you back. And I'm also really looking forward to the awesome workshop that you and Julia Skinner are going to be offering at the upcoming joint conference of the Society for Economic Botany and Society of Ethnobiology that's going to be in Atlanta this June. So, so much to catch up on and talk about today. Well, thanks so much for having me on your podcast again. And I am looking forward to um, coming to Atlanta for those conferences in a couple of months. And um you know, I mean, I think that, I, I mean, to me, fermentation is just, a, you know, a really integral part of, um, you know, what we would describe as ethnobiology. And, you know, it's just such an important part of how people everywhere make effective use of whatever kinds of food they have in abundance. Yeah, for sure. Well, and for those of you that are that are watching the video version of this, Sandor has such the appropriate shirt for this episode. <laughs> it, is, it is a shirt of pickles, of lactofermented pickles, and he's surrounded in his wonderful home laboratory of many, many different fermented goodies. And I'm so curious about all these items you've got there. Um, what do you want to, what do you want to talk about first? You've got lots to, to start. Well, with. I mean, for, I mean, since, since I have these pickles on my shirt, mm -hmm. I might as well, you know, acknowledge that, you know, pickles were really my gateway into fermentation. And, you know, I grew up in New York city and my grandparents were all immigrants from Eastern Europe. And, you know, the pickles that I grew up eating are, you know, are these kinds of pickles. They're, you know, what in New York City we call uh, sour pickles. Uh, in the U.S. outside of New York, they're often known as kosher dill pickles. Mm -hmm. But, you know, when I was a kid, I had no idea how they were made. I just knew that I loved to eat them um, and that they had a distinctive flavor. And then, you know, sometimes I'd be over at my friend's house and, you know, the, the, they would have pickles that had a different kind of a flavor. And, I like those also, but, you know, I always loved the pickles we had the most. And, you know, now I can say that like the pickles that that, that I grew up eating, well, the, 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 the acid in them, the acid that's preserving the vegetables is lactic acid that's generated by lactic acid bacteria over the course of a fermentation. Um, you know, a, a pickle really is defined as, you know, anything preserved in an acidic medium. And, you know, most of the pickles that fill our contemporary American supermarket shelves, at any rate, um, are, are, you know, cucumbers and many other things that are preserved in a vinegar solution. And, mm -hmm. you know, those also are pickles, but vinegar is acetic acid and vinegar is a product of fermentation. It's basically sugars fermented by yeast into alcohol. And then they undergo a secondary fermentation by acetobacter, which are these aerobic bacteria that can only function in the presence of oxygen and they metabolize alcohol into acetic acid and acetic acid has a different flavor than lactic acid. And, um, you know, they both are legitimately pickles, but they're made by very different kinds of processes. And, um, you know, my general understanding is that in most regions of the world, the older traditions of pickling are lactic acid pickles. And it's, you know, sort of really only 
beginning in the mid 20th century with the um, advent of the process that produces the vinegar that's cheaper than water at the supermarket, distilled white vinegar. You know, once vinegar became so cheap, then there were certain commercial advantages to, you know, pickling vegetables under vinegar rather than through a fermentation process. And it has the, you know, it has the benefit of creating a, a much more shelf stable uh, product that can, you know, sit almost indefinitely on supermarket shelves, you know, whereas the lactic acid pickles are certainly a strategy for preserving vegetables, but it's really about extending their useful life. It's not forever. And, um, um, you know, especially in, in warm climates like where we live, you know, once you're in the hot summer temperatures, um, um, you know, there are enzymes in the vegetables that will turn them into mush. So, yeah. you know, there are limits to, you know, how long food can be preserved um, um, using these traditional methods. But, you know, what I would point out is that the um, you know, the critical time for preserving vegetables is cold weather when there's no fresh vegetables. Um, um, so, you know, lactic acid fermentation does a great job of, of, of preserving vegetables from periods of abundance into and through the periods of scarcity, which in, you know, most cl temperate climates would be a time when it's colder when there's no fresh vegetables to eat. And so, you know, fermented vegetables really in many contexts have been important survival foods to get, uh, uh, enable people to preserve essential vegetable nutrients to um, sustain them through the period of relative scarcity, generally the winter time when there is, you know, not so much abundance of uh, uh, fresh vegetables. Yeah, I've totally seen this in field studies where, you know, folks are gathering wild foods or they're cultivating foods and harvesting them. And, and you're right, when when you don't have that option to go to the grocery store, when you're dependent upon all that you gather and grow yourself, this is a fantastic way to preserve those, those nutrients. I guess one thing that might be, um, I think, interesting to the audience too is, can you differentiate between, you know, what's going on with lactic acid fermenting bacteria in these, because this is really like a probiotic that you're consuming, right? Whereas vinegar pickles are not. Can, can you elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah, sure. So, um, I mean, basically, so first, let me just say that lactic acid bacteria are ubiquitous. And there's mm -hmm. a little bit of confusion sometimes because they're called lactic acid bacteria. People imagine that the source of them is from milk. And, you know, while, while certainly all milk has lactic acid bacteria and the spontaneous fermentation of the raw milk of healthy animals um, um, uh, is a lactic acid fermentation that creates lactic acid and the lactic acid, you know, it basically protects and preserves the milk. It's not only milk that is lactic acid bacteria. I mean, you know, botanists and uh, microbiologists have come to the broad conclusion that all plants growing out of soil on planet Earth are host to lactic acid bacteria. It's, they're certainly not the only bacteria present on plants. They're not even necessarily the dominant bacteria that, that, that are present on plants. But once you get vegetables submerged, um, um, you know, generally under a saltwater brine solution, every single time lactic acid bacteria are what will become dominant in that environment. And so you basically have bacteria that are already on the vegetables. You create the condition that is conducive to their rapid proliferation and growth. And then as they, as they grow, what they're doing is they're consuming carbohydrates from the vegetables and transforming them into lactic acid, as well as some other um, you know, relatively minor byproducts. But the lactic acid in particular is what enables the vegetables to be preserved safely. And, you know, food does not really get safer than uh, uh, fermented vegetables. Um, because, you know, if there happened to be some cells that got on the vegetables of salmonella, E. coli, other kinds of, uh, other kinds of uh, um, um, bacteria that could potentially be pathogenic to us, none of them can survive in, a, in an acidic environment. So as the lactic acid bacteria metabolize carbohydrates into lactic acid and make the environment increasingly um, acidic, what they're doing is they're wiping out any potential pathogens. 
um, and they're enabling both the tissue of the vegetable and the nutrients of the vegetable to be preserved. Not necessarily infinitely or or indefinitely, but you know over some period of time. And you know the the other things that can happen is that th there are enzymes in the vegetables. And you know, for instance, what makes vegetables crispy and crunchy are pectins. And there are enzymes in the vegetables that are called pectinase enzymes that can make them get soft and mushy over time. So, you know, generally when people decide that, you know, their pickles have, you know, lived out, lived out their, their, their useful life, it's not that they've become, you know, dangerous uh, uh, to eat or toxic in any way. It's that they have lost their aesthetic appeal because they've become soft and mushy because of these enzymes. And, um, the more salt you use in the process, the, 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 the more those enzymes will be inhibited and slowed down. The cooler the environment where you can store the vegetables, the slower those enzymes will be. Um, um, you know, but but once you generate that lactic acid, you know, the vegetables are, are safe to eat for a very, very long period of time. Now, in contrast, you know, uh, vinegar, um, uh, Generally, when you're making vinegar pickles, what you're doing is you're, you're heating up a vinegar and water and salt solution, and then you're pouring. And, and, and so, you know, to the extent that there were probiotic bacteria in the vinegar solution to begin with, the heating it up destroys mm. them. And then um, um, once you pour that hot water over the vegetables, then whatever kind of, you know, indigenous um, uh, populations of live bacteria were on the vegetables also get destroyed. Um, and so, you know, it's a trade-off. I mean, that's one of the reasons why vinegar pickles can be stable for such long periods of time on the supermarket, because it was hot vinegar poured over them and then generally they're further heat processed. Mm -hmm. um, you know, whereas um, um, lactic acid bacteria, if they're not heat processed, uh, you know, really maintain this, um, um, you know, probiotic quality, which is these, you know, sort of communities of, of uh, organisms dominated by lactic acid bacteria, which, you know, have the potential to, um, you know, contribute to biodiversity in, in, in our human digestive systems. And, um, you know, really probiotics are all about biodiversity and, you know, all of these services that bacteria uh, provide for us, you know, among them, the ability to effectively digest food and assimilate nutrients, a lot of our immune function, um, um, lots of sort of, you know, regulation of uh, different biochemical processes in our bodies. But, um, um, you know, these processes are all just served by greater biodiversity. And, you know, because of chemical exposure from, you know, antibiotic drugs to agricultural chemicals to chlorine in water, you know, all of this chemical exposure has the effect of diminishing biodiversity in the, in the gut. You know, furthermore, changes in our modern diets, most notably eating less fiber. Um, um, is contributing to a diminishment of biodiversity in the gut. So, you know, eating, you know, these biodiverse probiotic foods, you know, really are a strategy for restoring biodiversity and potentially improving digestion, improving immune function and improving other biochemical processes in the body. Yeah, that's amazing. I love this idea because it really is about eating for health right? Because you're not just, you're not just eating for the sake of enjoying the sour flavor of the pickle, but you're also increasing biodiversity of the gut. Well, and I know well, there are I a mean, lot of, I, yeah. I just think it has to be both. Yeah, because, absolutely. You know, okay. If you have some food in your, in your, in your refrigerator that like you don't especially like, but you have the idea that it's good for you, you're probably mm -hmm. not going to eat it that much. So, you, you know, I would say, you know, pickles are also incredibly delicious and yeah. And, and I mean, many products of fermentation are, I mean, if you walk into a gourmet food store, most of what you're going to see are products of fermentation and they're not there because they're regarded as being so healthy. They're there because they just have these, 
compelling flavors that's like nothing else. And so, you know, I mean, cheeses are all fermented, cured meats are fermented, condiments are fermented, mm -hmm. chocolate is fermented, coffee is fermented. I mean, an incredible range of, you know, our most beloved foods are, are, are products of fermentation. And furthermore, Fermentation's everywhere. I mean, so, you know, we have, you know, the, 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 the range of fermented foods we're familiar with, uh, you know, from, you know, our lives in the U.S. or maybe wherever our families uh, 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 came from. But, you know, the simple fact is that, you know, people in every part of the world developed distinctive processes for, um, you know, harnessing this invisible life force this is, that is just present on, on all of our food. I mean, you know, we didn't specifically know about the bacteria on our food and still until, you know, the second half of the 19th century when Louis Pasteur was doing his research. But you know, people observed um, um, everywhere that under different um, uh, conditions, their food would fare differently over time. And without knowing about these bacteria, you know, people everywhere developed elaborate techniques for, you know, harnessing this invisible life force that, that that's part of our food. That's incredible. Well, I know that many of the listeners um, to the show are also home gardeners. And I myself have got some seedlings started at home and hopefully they'll manage okay with transplant once we're past the risk of frost. But, you know, some of the plants that I'm very eager to grow this year include a lot of different cucumbers. So I'm wondering, could you walk us through, you said it was your gateway, like how hard is it for the average person to take a cucumber out of their garden and make a delicious, crisp, sour pickle? I mean, it's not that hard, but I will say in the realm of fermenting vegetables, it's the hardest. Okay. And it's because the watery summer vegetables like uh, uh, um, cucumbers have relatively high concentrations of these enzymes that can make them get soft. So a couple of tips for fermenting uh, 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 pickles. Um and then, I mean, let me just say that any any vegetable can be pickled. I mean, here I have a jar of, uh, uh, this is pao tsai. This is a Chinese style of fermenting vegetables. And, you know, you know there, there, this is a little wedge of cabbage. Uh, there's some carrots. There's some, there's some celery. Um, and, uh, you know, any vegetables can be fermented. And these firmer vegetables are easier to ferment. Okay. And, um, but, but you asked about cucumbers and, and there are some techniques to, mm -hmm. um, um, uh, um, you, you know, trying to encourage, to discourage, to inhibit these enzymes. So, okay. you know, number one, you're growing your own cucumbers. That's great. The fresher the cucumbers, the better. You mm -hmm. know, if you can harvest cucumbers and then pickle them on the same day, they're going to stay um, um, uh, crisper much longer than if you buy them at the store, meaning that they were, you know, harvested last week or, or, or at some earlier time. If you are working from store-bought cucumbers, what I would highly recommend is soak them in ice water for mm. a half an hour before you start. Um, um, you know, that seems to really help firm things up. Another trick is that every cucumber has a stem side and a blossom side. Um, and so where you don't see the stem is where the blossom side is. Take a little paring knife, or if you have long fingernails, you can just use your fingernail and scrape away any residue of the blossom from the blossom side, because that's really where you'll find the greatest concentration of these enzymes. So, you know, get rid of um, 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 any residue mm -hmm. from, from the blossom. Um, then you want to use a fairly salty brine when you're working with cucumbers because salt will also, uh, to some degree, inhibit these, these enzymes. So generally, when I'm, when I'm pickling cucumbers, I mix up a 5% brine solution. And what that means is it's much easier in metric than it is in the imperial system. So for a liter of water, which is just a little bit more than a quart of water, you would use about 50 grams of salt, which is about three tablespoons of salt. So you wanna mix a fairly salty brine solution. Now, you wanna use as little brine as possible over the, uh, over the vegetables. So generally, less than half of your volume will be this brine. So 
your pickles actually won't be 5% salt. They'll be more like two to two and a half percent salt. But that's a really, I mean, to me, that's a very um, um, uh, nice level of salt to eat, but it also is a high enough level of salt to really slow down those enzymes. Then the other thing is if you live in a hot environment like you do in Atlanta and I do mm -hmm. in Tennessee, then, you know, you don't want to ferment them at ambient temperature for um, for weeks. Um, and, you know, as you might if you came from, you know, Russia or Poland or mm -hmm. somewhere where there are big traditions of eating these kinds of cucumbers, but the temperatures tend to be considerably lower. Um, so, you know, when, when, when I do them, you know, in, in my kitchen, which is not air conditioned at all. So, you know, the days in my kitchen will often be up in the 80s uh, uh, Fahrenheit. And then, you know, the, and then the nights might just get down into the 70s. So it's staying pretty warm most of the time, um, um, you know, I, I'll just let leave them on the counter long enough for the color to change from, you know, the bright green of a fresh cucumber to the duller olive green of, um, of, of a finished pickle. And then once they change color, then I put them in the refrigerator and I leave, I try to like bury them in the back of the fridge for like two more weeks. Um, um, and the lactic acid bacteria will continue to, you know, produce more lactic acid, make the flavor more sour. Now, the one other thing I neglected to mention is adding grape leaves. There, oh. there are traditions in a lot of places of adding grape leaves, sour cherry leaves, horseradish leaves, um, you know, generally what all these have in common is tannins mm -hmm. and it's the tannins that help to slow down these uh, 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 enzymes. So, you know, where I live, I can just walk outside and find some grape leaves. If you live in an urban area, maybe if you go to a farmer's market, ask any of the farm vendors who you know if they could bring you a handful of grape leaves because most farms will have grapes growing on the edges. Um, people sometimes tell me they, they've had success using other kinds of tannins, um, including putting a tea bag in, oh. picking some oak leaves. Um, um, so, you know, there's other possible things you can do. My, my, my go-to is, is grape leaves. So um, fresh cucumbers, ice water, scraping off the blossom end, um, adding a handful of grape leaves, a strong enough brine, generally a 5% brine, and a short fermentation if you're in a hot environment, but let it continue in the refrigerator. Amazing. Okay. I think I can definitely follow those instructions and I'm sure many of our listeners will be eager to do so as well. That's so cool. Well, I know Sandra, you've also worked with much more complex recipes in your, in your journeys. And I want to make sure we have time to talk about your latest book about fermentation journeys. Okay. First of all, what, what I'm kind of, of so yeah, can, so show can, us so off the cover. Off. It's a okay. great cover. Yeah. So, you know, what, what are some of the big takeaways from your latest book? Where do you take readers? Well, I, you know, I, th this book is about fermented foods and beverages that I've learned about mostly in my travels, in some cases mm -hmm. from, you know, people who I've met who are from or whose families are from different parts of the world that I have not personally been to. Um, and so, you know, this is really uh, an exploration of, of global fermentation traditions. And, you know, as, as I said earlier, you know, fermentation is practiced everywhere. You know, I would, I would describe fermentation as an essential aspect of how people everywhere make effective use of whatever food resources are available to them. And, um, uh, you know, in, on every continent, uh, of the world in every place where, you know, there are long traditions of human settlement, there are traditions of fermentation. So, um, you know, um, um, you know, a lot of it is driven by places where I've been invited to teach about fermentation. And then my hosts have taken me to, um, uh, you know, meet local people who are making, um, uh, uh, you know, some kind of distinctive local fermentation. So, you know, for instance, Mexico, which is a place that I have traveled to a number of times to teach about fermentation. You know, there's an incredibly wonderful beverage that I've fallen in love with called pulque. Now, pulque is a, 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 a a short, spontaneous fermentation of the sap of maguey. Maguey is uh, like a succulent plant from uh, 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 dry land environments. Mm -hmm. 
you know, you don't really see my gay where 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 I live here, um, um, or probably where 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 you live in Atlanta. So it's not really something that you know I can make at home because I have no access to this plant, and it takes quite a few plants to get enough sap to make any significant amount amount of pulque. So you know, pulque would be an example of something that's very specific to its environment. But you know, ultimately, I would say that you know all food traditions are specific to environments or at least emerged as specific to specific environments and and you know fermentation is 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 no different um, mm -hmm. You know, the things that we ferment are the things that are abundant. And what is abundant is going to really have to do a lot with what your environment is, what your climate is, um, um, and things like that. And then furthermore, how you can ferment them is going to depend to some degree on, you know, what what the temperature and humidity conditions are, are, are like in that place. So some of the things like pulque, you know, I write about them because I think that they're really interesting, but people really who cool. live outside of the range of where the specific plant grows are not necessarily going to be able to replicate them. But other things, uh, um, you know, I've investigated and, you know, kind of developed recipes. So for instance, um, I already showed this, this jar of um, pao cai. Pao cai is a Chinese name that means almost exactly the same thing as sauerkraut. It just means like hmm. sour vegetables uh, 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 in Chinese. And, you know, there's, there's certainly not like a unified way that everybody in China is making their pao cai. I mean, I've spent about a total of two weeks in China, so I could hardly be regarded <laughs> as an expert, but, um, uh, you know, I, I got to try enough people's, uh, en enough, you know, uh, families and chefs pao cai to realize that like, oh, this is not a unified practice at all. People make it a, a lot of different ways. But as it happens, the first day that we were in China, we randomly met this woman whose name was Mrs. Ding. She lives in Chengdu, which is the capital of uh, uh, Sichuan province. And, um, you know, the way we met her was kind of funny because we were just walking around our first day uh, arriving in China. We were a little bit jet lagged. Um, uh, we we're walking around in the afternoon and I saw these sausages hanging and curing from a clothes hanger outside of a window. And I just like took out my phone and started taking some pictures of it. But then the woman whose sausages they were saw me taking pictures and came out and started talking to us. And, you know, thankfully, I was the only one in our party who didn't speak Chinese. And um, and and, um, uh, you know, once she heard that we were like we were there to investigate fermentation, she invited us into the apartment and, you know, she served us a beautiful lunch and then she gave us a pickling lesson. And, and, and so, you know, these, these are, are, you know, more or less Mrs. Ding's recipe for pao cai. And so it, it's a brine. She uses a much less salty uh, a brine than I just described for the cucumber pickles, um, um, you know, probably closer to 2% salt. And then also she puts a little bit of sugar into the brine, which is mm. which doesn't make the pickles sweet. What it does is it gets the fermentation going really mm. quickly. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and in the end, it ends up being more assertively sour. Um, and then it has all kinds of different seasonings in it. Um, um, yeah, I see that uh, star anise there. Uh, yeah, yeah, there, yeah, there's some there's some star anise. There's uh, Sichuan peppercorns. Mm. There's ginger. Mm -hmm. um, there's black cardamom. Um, um, uh, uh, and I put some licorice root in it also, a little dry nice. licorice root. So I mi make this spiced brine. Then the first batch of vegetables that you put in, and you know, I, I, my my general guidance would be use firm vegetables. Um, but the, and, and, and you want them, you don't want to like grate the vegetables or, or make them tiny because then you're never going to separate the vegetables from the seasonings that are in there, but also you don't want the pieces to be too big or else the flavors won't be able to penetrate in mm. time into the center. So, you know, sort of medium chunks of vegetables that are going to be easy to pull out, but, but, um, but the, the flavors will be able to penetrate relatively quickly. And the first batch of vegetables that you use with this brine will take about two weeks. But the cool thing about this is it's a perpetual brine. So I've oh, been nice. reusing the same brine for about five years now. And of course, you know, salt migrates out with the vegetables. So I add more salt. The flavor of the various seasonings will, 
you know, will also migrate out and be spent over time. So I'm, I, you know, periodically replenishing and putting mm-hmm. some more ginger slices of ginger root in, putting another piece of star anise in, putting some more Sichuan peppercorns in. So, you know, o- o- over time you have to augment it, but the brine itself gets sort of denser and denser with, with flavor and with lactic acid bacteria. So if the first batch of pickles take two weeks, then, you know, once the brine is really mature, you can put vegetables in for 24 hours wow. and, 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 and pull them out in their pickles. So, um, so, you know, this is a really wonderful thing that I, that I learned about in my travels and wrote about in this book that's, you know, really very easy to replicate in any kind of a home kitchen. And, you know, I mean, what I encourage people reading my recipes to do is that, you know, don't consider the, this like set in stone. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, I, you know, I learned Mrs. Ding's way. I've kind of tweaked her recipe a little bit, but you can tweak it too. You know, she didn't put garlic in. If you love garlic, you can add some garlic into yours. If you don't like the, the, the numbing flavor of Sichuan peppercorns, you can leave them out. Oh, I forgot chilies. I put a few oh, dried nice. chilies in here, in mm-hmm. here also. But if you don't like, uh, if, if you don't like the heat of chilies, you can leave that out. It's a very versatile process. And what I observed just from tasting a half a dozen different people's pickles is that everybody does it a little bit differently. I mean, just just like, the, you know, these kinds of pickles. I mean, I, the ones that I grew up with were like garlicky, lots of dill. Mm-hmm. I taught a workshop in Poland and some of my students got into a heated argument about how to season cucumber pickles. And, you know, some of them were like, oh, never dill, use allspice. You know, there's regional variations there. And ultimately, all of this comes down to family recipes. You know, what is what is a particular grandma's, you know, special, um, 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 you know, secret je ne sais quoi that that distinguishes her pickles from from other people's. It's really just like any other form of cooking in that regard. That's amazing. It it makes me think a little bit of sourdough because you're really cult. You're farming, you're cultivating that microbial community as you go on and continue to use it. I mean, that's, that's really exciting. And I know you are, you know, um, uh, uh, amazing at making sourdough as well. And I see you've got a, a yeah, jar. Got a, this, there. Is, this, is, yeah. this is my, this is my sourdough starter. Mm-hmm. Um, actually, this is a, this is a loaf of bread that, uh, oh, that I just made uh, uh, yesterday that, 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 that we've been eating. Um, and, of, and of course, there's no singular way of, of making sourdough. Um, um, you know, let, let me just lay out a little bit of a, a sort of conceptual framework yeah. for your listeners for, for, for thinking about fermentation. So pure culture starters, a packet of yeast that you can buy in any store. Um, you know, there's a lot of more specialized pure culture starters that we can buy today. Like I, I make koji. Koji is a Japanese mm-hmm. name for uh, rice, barley, barley, soybeans, others grown with a particular fungus, aspergillus or rice. Um, you know, I buy koji starter that's imported from Japan. I make tempeh, which is an Indonesian style of fermented soybeans. And I buy um, um, a pure culture starter for making my, my tempeh, Rhizopus oligosporus. There are people who are trying to sell you Lactobacillus plantarum as a starter for making sauerkraut. I've never bought a starter for making sauerkraut. But what I like to point out to people is these pure culture starters, you know, really only became possible at the very end of the 19th century. And all of the fermentation for the first like 10,000 years of human cultural fermentation practice, you know, has been, you know, finding the organisms in other ways. And so one way to do that is what I what, what what is called wild fermentation, which happens to be the title of my first book Love about that fermentation. Book. Yeah. But mm-hmm. I didn't make up this phrase. It's found throughout the literature of fermentation. And what it describes is fermentation based on the organisms that are present on the food that you're fermenting, or to a limited degree on your hands or in the air around you. But really generally it's from the food you're fermenting. So um you know, a uh, 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 outside sauerkraut, kimchi, pickles, all fermented vegetables rely on, on bacteria that are on the vegetables. Milk, 
Um, um, you know, I mean, now you can buy all these special pure culture starters to make different styles of cheeses. But, you know, historically, in most places, cheese has been made based on the bacteria that are in the milk that you're working with. And, and so you keep the temperatures low enough that those bacteria uh, maintain their viability and then they're driving the, 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 the fermentation. Sourdough. You know, when I started my starter here, you know, it was just flour and water. And, um, um, you know, all the, all the yeast and all the lactic acid bacteria that you need, they're on the flour. It takes a little bit of cultivation. There's technique to it. You don't just mix them together and then you can make bread. You have to feed it multiple times. You have to, you know, kind of coddle it a little bit. But, you know, once it gets really vigorous, then you can make bread with it. So wild fermentation is just anything based on the organisms that are present on the food. Now, there are, there are a few different traditional means of what I would call culturing, introducing specific um, uh, populations of organisms that are not pure culture starters. And, you know, one of them would be like we do with the sourdough. I, the, the word we have in English is very vivid. I love it. It's called um, back slopping. So you take <laughs> a little bit of the previous batch and you introduce that uh, um, as the starter for the new batch. So, you mm -hmm. know, I started this in the 20th century, like this is wow. from the 90s. And I, and I have been maintaining it ever since then. And the way I maintain it is I never use all of it. You know, every mm -hmm. time I, I, I make bread or sometimes I make pancakes or sometimes I make this wonderful Eastern European beverage that I'll bet you've had called kvass. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes I'll make sour Polish soup uh, 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 called Kisil. Uh, no, no, I'm sorry. I'm, 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 I'm using the wrong name, but you know, I make a, there, there's a mm -hmm. sour, uh, uh, a soup that you can make, uh, uh, out of it. Um, recently, a, a, a student of mine from Cyprus introduced me to a style of fermented vegetables that uses diluted really? sourdough discard with salt added to it as a medium for fermenting vegetables. But, any, but anyway, I never use whatever application I'm using this for. I never use all of it. I always save a little bit of it and add fresh flour and fresh water. And that's how I've been able to maintain it. That's back slopping. That's yes. also how I maintain my yogurt culture. So, mm -hmm. um, um, uh, you know, I never eat all of my yogurt. I always save a jar that says starter on it. And then when I'm ready to make more yogurt, I, I use that jar as the starter for another larger batch of, 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 of yogurt. And I've been able to perpetuate this or not since the nineties, but for about 10 years now, wow. um, um, I've been perpetuating this. So backslopping is one way of perpetuating these cultures over time. And I mean, an incredible range of foods and beverages can be um, uh, perpetuated with backslopping. I, um, I have a friend who's a brewer in North Carolina who has one fermentation tank that he never fully empties. And he always leaves a couple of gallons of the previous batch, which function as the starter for the next batch of wort that he puts in there to ferment. I've met salami makers who save a little, who, who always start a new batch of salami with a piece of the mature salami from the nice. last batch of salami. So there's a lot of different foods and beverages that can be perpetuated through, through this process. There, there's a wonderful um, Caribbean fermented beverage that's called uh, uh, Mabi on the English speaking islands and Mavi on the Spanish speaking islands. And I first heard about it from a woman from Puerto Rico who actually sent me the bark of the Mavi tree to make it. But she was like, I don't know what you're going to use as a starter because everybody here uses their previous batch of Mavi as the starter for the next one. Mm -hmm. So, you know, now, now that I've been making it, I always save a jar in the refrigerator of the previous batch of Mavi and I use that as the starter for the next one. So all kinds of things can be perpetuated like that. The other kind of a starter, other than the pure culture technological starters and, and backslopping are these starters that have evolved into distinctive physical forms. So mm -hmm. um, uh, we call these SCOBIs, symbiotic communities of bacteria and yeast. And right now, probably the most well-known example of this would be kombucha. Mm -hmm. So it's the mother of kombucha looks like a rubbery pancake. Uh, and then you mix up some, some fresh sweet tea, cool it down, and then you just put that, that, that 
pancake and it floats on top and this community of organisms that are part of it like grow into the sweet tea metabolize sugars into acids and a little bit of alcohol um and also the mother grows thicker and thicker so anybody you meet who's been making kombucha regularly has more than they know what to do with of the kombucha mothers and they're always eager to give them away and uh and and share them and you know when i first got introduced to to um, kombucha in the in the mid 90s I mean there was no such thing as commercial kombucha it was it was spread exclusively through this um, you know kind of grassroots exchange of kombucha mm -hmm. mothers but it was a little bit like a like 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 a pyramid scheme I mean everybody everybody <laughs> who you know was making kombucha was like just just desperate for you know people to give them to because nobody wanted to throw away their their kombucha mothers Although, as I've written about in, in, in a couple of my books, you know, you can make candy out of them. You can mm -hmm. make savory, chewy, like jerky like things out of them. There's a lot of things you can do with with extra kombucha mothers. But but anyway, the, the, the kombucha is one of a, of a handful of cultures that have evolved into these distinctive uh, macro forms that we can see and that we can hold that are um uh host to some some uh, uh great biodiversity and they're very interesting because you know the organisms that are part of them somehow collectively spin this skin that they share and coordinate their reproduction another example of this would be kefir which is mm -hmm. another form of fermented milk but kefir is these like it doesn't look at all like a kombucha mother they're these little blobs so they're generally called kefir grains or sometimes kefir curds and they look a little bit like florets of cauliflower hmm. and 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 but 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 they're the embodiments of this extraordinary biodiversity i mean more than 30 distinct organisms have been identified that are that that, that are part of it and wow. it's much easier to make than than yogurt i mean you just plop it into some milk agitate it a couple of times over a 24 hour period in cool weather, it might take 48 or as long as 72 hours, but it just sits at room temperature, agitated a couple of times, and then your kefir grains grow, and they acidify the milk, and they produce a little bit of alcohol, um, um, but, you know, it's a really extraordinary uh, 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 beverage that sometimes has been called the champagne of milks. It is champagne. -y. I wonder, have you ever had this beverage um, called Iron? It's uh, common in Turkey. It's kind of a salty yogurt beverage, but I don't know how it's made exactly. It's, it's, I, I, it's very I've heard tasty. Of it. I've heard of it, but I, mm -hmm. I I haven't I have not spent any time in Turkey. Yeah. Although in, in, in this book, I I I'm um, um, I have a. Uh, uh, met at a conference years ago and had a long-term correspondence with a with a Turkish food writer mm. um, um, and uh, there's a section of this book um, uh, that's about Tarhana. Oh um, I don't know what that um, is. What is Tarhana? I mean it's basically like yogurt and wheat hmm. and often tomatoes or other kinds of vegetables and you mix them all you mix it all together you would get the vegetables into very you know small pieces mix it all together let it ferment together and then dry it in the sun if your environment permits it and a dehydrator uh Aylin calls it like the original instant soup um, <laughs> um so you know you're just taking all of these like flavorful elements Mm -hmm. mixing them together, fermenting them, and then drying them. And then you simply add water to them if you want to, you know, in the simplest application, or you can cook them together like a roux and make like a gravy kind of thing with them. Nice. But, you know, really, really flavorful. And it's just got all these different elements. It's got, you know, it's got sour. It's got salty. It's got like umami vegetable uh, mm -hmm. uh, flavors. It has body from like the from from the gluten in the weed. It has fat from the yogurt. It just has sort of so many components of delicious flavor. And, um, you know, it's just a really great way to, you know, preserve the abundance of a certain moment of the year to um, um, you know, get people through the rest of the year. And even if you're not sort of, um, um, you know, sort of living through traditional agricultural cycles, it's still delicious and um, you know, very fun to play with. Yeah, 
Oh my gosh. I wish Sandor, I had had a class, like a real home economics class in like middle or high school that taught us these things. Because when I was a child, we were taught how to mix, you know, canned syrup of fruit with the packaged, you know, cake mix to, to make food. And I'm just thinking what a difference it could make for kids across, across this country, if they had a better understanding of how to take the simplest of ingredients and make such incredible foods. And I know that, you know, this audience is very appreciative of you sharing this with us. Um, where, where can they find your information? Where can they find your book? Like where, where can I send them, um, to learn more about your work? Well, sure. Well, hopefully you could find my books wherever you like to buy Mm -hmm. books. Um, But I do have a website. My website is called wildfermentation.com. That was the name of my my first book. And, uh, you know, on my website, you can find um, information about my books. You can order books and, and my friends uh, um, who have a fermentation business uh, uh, in my town, fill the orders. And so, you know, you can buy your books directly from me, or at least read about them and try to understand which one you would want to get and get it wherever you like to get books. Also, you can find out about my workshops. I do a lot of teaching. I do some teaching here at my place, but then I also travel all over. I just, a couple of weeks ago, I was uh, teaching in Arkansas. I'm mm-hmm. going to Minneapolis in a couple of weeks. I'm coming to Atlanta in June. Um, so, you know, I, 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 I get around and, and travel a lot of different places, uh, uh, to teach about fermentation. I'm going to Brazil, uh, at the end of April, nice. uh, and teaching there. Um, and also on my website, I have just links to all kinds of fermentation related resources that exist on, on the world wide web. I mean, um, you know, I might have, I, you know, I might have had a role in sort of, you know, catalyzing the revival of fermentation in the present moment. But, you know, fermentation is just such an integral part of, you know, of all of our culinary traditions. So, you know, wherever, you know, wherever your, um, you know, ancestors might be from, um, uh, you know, there there are examples of fermentation in, in that part part of the world. And it's really a lot of like the, you know, the, 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 the flavors that get mm-hmm. passed down and, you know, and especially because of the important role of, of fermentation in, in seasonings, you know, whether it's, you know, whether it's soy sauce, whether it's, you know, vinegar based seasonings, like, you know, mustard or horseradish, whether mm-hmm. it's like, you know, West African cuisine has an incredibly interesting group of uh, uh, fermented seasonings. It has a lot of different names, which is what makes it hard to talk about in a general way. Dawa Dawa is a name. Sumbala is a name. Iru is a name. But there are all these fermentations of African locust beans Mm. that have a sort of really, really, you know, strong flavor. I think, you know, if people tried to eat it just alone, most people would find it to be overpowering, but that's not the way it's eaten. It's, 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 it's used like a little bit in stews and it really gives a lot of the, you know, characteristic flavor uh, um, um, uh, of, of many foods uh, from, from that part of the world. Um, um, you know, my computer is sitting on top of a, a crock of, of soy sauce. Um, and so, you know, <laughs> in another great. part of the world, you know, soy sauce and miso and other related seasonings are um, the products of, of long fermentation processes. So, um, um, you know, every, every, every Everybody's traditions, um, um, you know, have fermentation as as part of them. That's great. Well, great ways to connect with each other, with your food, um, through these amazing recipes. Thanks so much for sharing this with us today, Sandra. It's great to have you on the show. Okay. Well, it's always a pleasure, Cassie. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks. You've been listening to Foodie Pharmacology, the science podcast for the food curious recorded um, this. uh, I think we're in March right now. Um, If you're interested in getting over to the Society for Economic Botany and Ethnobiology Conference, make sure that you register before April 15th. That's our early registration deadline. Sandra will be there with Julia Skinner um, giving an amazing workshop on um, fundamentals of fermentation and really getting to the art of fermentation. I want to thank our producers to Christine Roth and Rob Cohen for bringing us the show each and every week. And thank you to you, our listeners, for tuning in. Stay healthy out there and I'll see you next time.